All right, if you got your Bibles, let's open up to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter number 6. Proverbs chapter number 6. We're not going to preach through the whole chapter. We're actually going to start in verses 16 and go through 19. Uh, we've covered some of the other chapter in previous message and also some of the other material dealing with the sluggards and things like that we're going to get later on in Proverbs. So tonight we're going to deal with another popular subject like last uh, Sunday night. Uh, you said that was hard to listen to. That was hard to preach. Um, but tonight we're going to deal with a subject you probably will not hear preached a lot, especially in the modern age. We're going to preach, the title of this is God Hates It. You know, God actually hates some things. And some people can't even fathom that in their, con in their concept of God. They don't even put those two words together. But the Bible does. Proverbs chapter 6, let's look at it. Verse number 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So the truth of the matter is, God actually hates some things. And oftentimes um, in society, people have an idea that God is love, so their logic goes like this. The major premise is that God is love. The minor premise is that the opposite of love is hate. Therefore, the conclusion would be God cannot hate anything because God is love. You know, I know of some parents, and I'm not getting on to you if that's how you raise your kids, and I understand kids can take words and language and really misuse it. You know, they will get on to kids when they use the word hate. Of course, I used to use the word hate in a lot of bad ways. You know, I hate green beans. <laughs> well, I don't know if you need to say that you hate green beans. Um, but the idea of, of misusing the word, I understand that. But it is a Bible word. And God actually hates some things. And even the Bible teaches us that God hates some individuals. I'll give you some verses. If you're in Proverbs, go ahead and back up to Psalm. Psalm 5. Look over in Psalm 5. We'll be turning in several places tonight. We'll try to keep it mainly in Psalms and Proverbs. Over in Deuteronomy, when he was giving the law, he mentioned the idols and images, and he says, Neither shalt thou set up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. Can you imagine being a part of a church that used images to induce people to worship? when God actually made the statement that he hated images? That's amazing. That would have to be a shocker if you sat in a church and everything's images and idols, and they say by way of the images you're able to worship God, and they actually changed the Ten Commandments where the, last, where the second commandment, thou shalt make no graven image, they removed that. And then they bust up the last commandment, thou shalt not covet, into thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and then the next commandment, thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's wife. Well, it's still all through the Bible. God said he hated the images, Deuteronomy 16. And so it's amazing when you see this in Scripture, and it really sets you back a little bit because God is not a man. And sometimes we, and I understand that, that we're made in God's image, and there's some attributes of God, we call them communicable. In other words, we can agree with them and we can understand them and identify with them. Some are incommunicable. There's some things about God we understand. We understand some of the emotions and some of the different things. Some things about God are, are true only about God, not about us. We are created. God is the uncreated. We're finite. God is infinite. We're limited. God is limitless. And so those are some things, and sometimes I think that we put God in our little human box, you know, and it's a lot of times based on the theology that we've just come to believe by way of our own minds instead of a theology from the Bible. Notice Psalm 5, come down, if you will, to verse number 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers. 
of iniquity. Preacher, I thought the Bible said God hates the sin but loves the sinner. That's not in the Bible. That's one of those little cliches like uh, people were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross and the New Testament by looking back to the cross. It's a cliche. It has no truth in it whatsoever. You know that Jesus is about to come back because you can't tell the difference between the seasons. That's not in the Bible either. <laughs> you know, people have all kind of things they think is in the Bible. But there's nowhere in the Bible that says God loves the sinner and hates the sin. There's, that's not in the Bible. Look at chapter 11, Psalm 11. One author said this, What is in a sinner but sin? When you think about that, John chapter number 3, He that believeth not is condemned already. If you're not saved, you're not under the love of God, you're under the judgment of God. So you're under the anger of God, and John 3.36, under the wrath of God. Look in Psalm 11, and that's a scary thing, but the good thing about that is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the good thing about that is God is a good God, and He does not want you to be under His judgment. That's why He sent Jesus Christ as the provision for your sin. Psalm 11, look at this, verse number 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. We don't have time to look at all the references. It's all through here. Um, but the Bible tells us, and if we're going to get some personal application from this, the Bible tells us there's a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Now, if you're in Psalm, flip over here, and I'll just show you some things here. Psalm 97. Psalm 97. We are to love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. Psalm 97. Your opinions ought to be God's opinions. You say, well, how do you know the mind of God? You read the words of God to find out what He thinks. You express yourself by way of words, and so did God. Somebody said, well, if God spoke out of heaven, he'd repeat himself because he already told us everything he wanted us to know in the Bible. So you have the mind of God so you can find the opinion of God, even if you don't have a black and white answer. If you read the Bible enough and you study it enough, you can find the principle and know God's mind on the matter. Look in Psalm 97. So we should love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. Psalm 97, verse number 9. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Verse 10. Look at this. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Do you love the Lord? You should hate evil. And then before you want to point your finger at all the evil people out there, we need to hate the evil in ourselves. Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, it's a sign of a Pharisee when you can point out all the bad in everybody else and you can't ever point out the bad in yourself. You're in Psalm still? Let's flip over 101. Psalm 101. Just a survey here. Psalm 101. Look down, if you will, in verse number 3. Psalm 101.3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Look over in 119, Psalm 119, the longest psalm and the longest chapter per se in the whole Bible. Psalm 119, come all the way down to 104. Psalm 119, 104. You know, when you love somebody, you... Um, you tend to agree with them on things. Especially you husbands and wives, you know. And look, don't get me wrong, I'm not against wives having the right to vote. I mean, I think you're a citizen, you ought to be able to vote. That kind of a thing. But if you're married and you love your husband, then you're going to vote the same way he's going to vote anyway. Nine times out of ten. And if someone's not married, typically they're, they're still under, if they're younger. I know exceptions prove the rule. But the idea that I'm getting from that is, okay, you have people that agree, can two walk together except they be agreed. If you agree with somebody, then you're going to be on the same track with them. And if we love God, we should love what God loves. Therefore, we're not going to love what He doesn't love. Look in Psalm 119, come down to, what did I tell you? 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. 
Now, if a Christian is not in the Word of God, he's not going to get God's understanding. Therefore, the Christian can be very susceptible to developing ideas and philosophies that are based on Satan's principles and Satan's precepts. The more he listens to the world, the more he may choose to agree with the world, the more he may choose to adopt what the world teaches. Therefore, he'll look at what God says and says, hmm, I don't know about that, even though God said it. That's a dangerous place to be in. Look in chapter 119, look in 113, verse 113. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Same place, look at 128. 128, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. You need to be a good hater. I was, gonna, I was working on a message a long time back where I had the theme, never developed it. It's called uh, Healthy Hate and Lousy Love. You know, there's a lousy love out there. People fall in love with the wrong people. They choose to do so. They get in the wrong place, and they fall in love with the wrong person. And it's all a choice. And oftentimes, people fall in love with the wrong things. They fall in love with things that they have no business falling in love with. And there's a healthy hate. And we don't even think in, in those terms. But that, that positive and negative. If you love God, you're going to hate the devil. You love righteousness, you're going to hate wickedness. You love holiness, you're going to hate evil. A thing balances out. So one more place, 163. Look in 163. Back up to 162. I rejoice at thy word, there's the positive, as one that findeth great spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. All right, let's get into the message. Come back to Proverbs chapter 6. So here's the seven abominations, these seven things that are given that God hates. And when you look down in the passage, he's not just talking about things. He says, an heart that devises wicked imaginations. It has to do with a person. Uh, people do things. So when you start talking about bad things, they're associated with bad people. All right, come to Proverbs chapter number 6. Let's look at the first one. Verse number 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven. Now, don't think that there's only seven things under God's creation that he hates. There's a, a word for this, and I didn't write it down in language. It's a, a, this is kind of a saying. It's kind of like we say, you know, we use the word all, or we use the word every, you know, and we, we're not using it as an all-inclusive thing. In other words, this is kind of a, a poetic expression saying, you know, there, these are some things. You know, here's six and seven. Think of it this way. Seven's the number of completion. So there's a completion or a perfection to this, and he's given you seven things. And you can put a lot of things under these seven categories. All right, so these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven, are an abomination. So notice the first one here. He says a proud look. So we're going to alliterate this. We'll have disdainful look. Pride. Boy, that's a killer. And that is a rough one for all of us. When you study the, the way that sin got into the universe, of course it came through the devil. Sin came into the world by way of Adam, but it came into the universe by way of the devil. People say, well, you know, death came by Adam. Well, death came upon men by Adam, but death came into the universe by way of the devil. I mean, you still have the whole death process. You have... All this stuff taking place when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. You have death in the universe, but death comes to man by way of Adam because Adam represents the federal headship of man, and he passes that on as a fallen creature to his descendants. And so when you begin to think about this, when you study the devil, he's called Lucifer, and the middle letter of Lucifer is I. And when you read that whole account there, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, those two passages... He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That rebellion, that pride swelled up in him. And that's really the first sin. There was a guy that said to his friend, well, at least I don't have any problem with the sin of pride. His friend replied, well, why should you? You ain't got nothing to be proud of. <laughs> Now, I know a lot of us use that, especially some of you older folks, you use the word proud and pride. You use the word proud a little bit differently. You'll say, well, I'm really proud of that. And we know what you mean by that. So when we talk about pride, we're not talking about self-esteem. Okay? 
self-esteem is definitely a good thing. In other words, you ought to have the, you, you esteem yourself a certain way, whether it's good or bad, okay? In Christ, you're complete. So you find your identity in Jesus Christ, not in your ancestors, not in maybe your country you live in, not maybe in how great your kids turned out, not in how wonderful your spouse is, not in how great your friends are or how great of a job you have or how much money you find in the bank. As a Christian, you find your self-esteem and your value in Jesus Christ. That means you meant so much to God that he shed his precious blood for. That's, you do matter to God. This whole thing where the world's flipped upside down with identity, the problem is they're trying to find identity in a fallen, wicked human nature. And once you do that, you have to keep backpedaling and justifying all kinds of sins. Some of you got skeletons in the closet and you got to justify that stuff because that's you. You don't need to, as a Christian, do not identify and identify yourself with those skeletons. You're dead. That stuff's old. It's gone. I don't care about it. The Lord doesn't care about it. If God forgot it, why do you remember it? So don't confuse the idea of pride with self-esteem, okay? And also don't confuse the idea of pride with rejoicing and honor that's given. There should be honor to whom honors do, correct? You know, and I understand when people come up and they say, Hey, you know, you, sang a, you did a great job. You sang a great song. You can say thank you. Praise the Lord. You don't have to say, just give God the credit. Just give God the praise. You know, I, I know what you're trying to do. And the same thing, you know, we try to do that kind of stuff. But when honor's given, honor's required, honor to whom honor's given, it's not a proudful thing to say thank you. So you want to understand the depths of pride. And he says a proud look because here's what's happening here. This is something on the inside that's manifesting itself on the outside. I think it's William Ernest Henley wrote the famous saying, you've heard it, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. <laughs> yeah, right. All it takes is a little virus to get a hold of you. All it takes is somebody to put a little bead on you, a little uh, dot. You know, they have no little lasers and there's something on the other end of that thing. Here's some indications of pride. Adrian Rogers, I quote him a lot. He's got some good material on this. How do you know if you have a problem with pride? Here we go. Does it irritate you when someone corrects you for your faults? Does it get under your skin when someone corrects you for your faults? Do you find yourself accepting praise for things over which you have no control? Kind of like Barney Fife. He gets that look, you know, like he, he's done figured it. He's got it all figured out. When you make a mistake, do you always have an alibi? Do you always have an excuse when you mess up? You might have a pride problem. A lot of times people do have a pride problem because of self-esteem issues. Because they are, they're trying to build themselves up. And so they get so mad, they're trying to hold on to this image, especially in modern day when everybody's trying to be in everybody's business. So therefore, you're only going to put the positive post. Who's going to put a picture of them on their social media thing when they wake up in the morning? <laughs> no, they want it to be where their hair is all dyed. Those of you that do that kind of thing, or they have hair 30 years ago. Like, that don't look like you. Yeah, that was a picture 30 years ago. Why are you putting it on there for yesterday's post? <laughs> or your family's all night. They're all standing around. They didn't take the picture five seconds before when they were all cussing at each other. <laughs> There's the little dog and the cat. They don't show what the cat just did on the living room floor. See, it's a, it's a false image. And then so when people get corrected or when things happen, they're, they're bucking at that because they're, they're having to defend themselves because they have put up this facade that's not really them. All right, let me move through these. How do you know you have a problem with pride? When someone wrongs you or does something you dislike, do you ever rationalize, well, I can get along without that individual. I don't need him or her. In other words, a sense of self-sufficiency that you don't need anybody that's pride. That middle letter in Lucifer is I. You are not an island. 
God did not make you to go through this life as a believer outside of a local assembly and outside of Christian friends. Amen. Amen. Do you find it difficult to seek counsel, to ask someone else for advice? Whether you know it or not, you don't have the corner on the market for all wisdom. There are people that, just like in sports, you know, all these people, they think they are the best. Some 19, 20, 20, 21-year-old kid playing baseball or something, you know, he thinks he's God's gift to the left field. There's somebody better than him. Let's give him one injury and he'll be, he'll be yesterday's news. Give him one injury and he might not play but one game. Do you find it difficult to do that one? Do you have an ungrateful spirit? It's a sign of pride. Here's the last one. Is your life marked by a sense of competition? Always comparing to someone else. Always trying to, well, they don't have this or they don't have that or I want to be like this. That's a dangerous place. We're in Proverbs, so let's uh, look at a few of these verses. Look in chapter 13. Proverbs 13. Now, I'm going to stay on pride longer than the others just because it, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the first one listed, so I think there's some importance here. Proverbs 13, look down in verse number 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Now think about that for a minute. When somebody's fighting and fussing, there's pride involved. Why? Because there's no compromise made. Because one person, even if they're wrong... You know what Paul says to the Corinthians? He goes, you all this bickering and fighting. Why don't you just suffer it? Why don't you just be defrauded? Let somebody do you wrong. Now, I'm not advocating, I don't think neither was Paul, for you always let people walk over you. There are cases, and I understand what Paul's talking about, people taking each other to court in the church. I get all that. But there are cases where, say, you're at an, a, a job and there is literal abuse, there's bad things happening, and you're like, well, I'm just going to take it, I'm just going to be defrauded. You know, you may set somebody up that's coming after you to be really hurt really bad. And so you have to take these other things into consideration. However, think about just little squabbles, little personality difference, just little things to where there's contention and strife. How come you just can't back up? How come you just can't say, you know, I'll let them have the last word. I don't have to be first. What does Brother Peacock always say? You don't have to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. Just let me back up and I'll let somebody else have the limelight. You can win the argument. Okay, your vacation was better than mine. I'm not going to tell you how great mine was. Just, just tell me all about it and I'll just glory in yours and I don't have to compare with you. Let's just back off. Only by pride cometh contention. Look in chapter 16. Proverbs 16. It's all through the Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 5. This is rough. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. You know, when you have that proud spirit, you know what you do? You push the Lord back. Instead of inviting the Lord to come fellowship with you, you're pushing Him back. Look in chapter um, Proverbs chapter 21. Verse 4, and high look. Now, this is the disdainful look that we're talking about, a proud look. You've seen it. Uh, uh, they walk in and they just, uh, and you ladies, y'all pick up on it more than I do. I don't understand it. Christy and I, we've been at a uh, mall or somewhere, and you walk in a store, and, and in five seconds, she's like, let's go. Turn around and go, on. Like, what the matter? You see them? You see that, that clerk or that whatever or whoever was working there, they didn't ask us. Or You know, you ladies, y'all can sense when somebody's being a jerk just by the way they look. I don't. You have these antennas, these invisible antennas that stick out there. And y'all can pick up on that stuff. I don't, I don't get it, you know. Um, but there is that look, that kind of, you know, just looking, looking you up and down. And can't believe you're where, you have that kind of a purse. Can't believe you wore that. You know, that, that just that, that disdainful look and that, that is pride on the inside coming out. And here in chapter number 21, and high look and a proud heart. Notice what he adds. And the plowing of the wicked is sin. Now think about this. Here's this guy's farmer out there plowing. And he's a wicked person. Even, and what this is telling us is that his sin is infecting everything that he does. The sin of pride will affect all of your life, every area of your life.
And that guy is plowing because he's full of pride. He's not thinking, God, I'm just praying and asking for you to give the rain because I don't know, Lord, I put the seed in, but you've got to germinate it. Lord, you've got to grow it. If you don't grow it, it ain't going to get growed. He's not thinking that way. He's thinking, man, look what a great row I did. Look what a good job. Man, I've worked on these horses, and I've got them where they're a pool. And man, look at the fruits of my ground. I've done a soul. Thou hast done much good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat for many years like the rich fool there. Built bigger barns. That's a proud fool. Man, there are people, they've, they've uh, maybe retired, or maybe they're toward retirement. They've got money in the bank. They've got fairly decent health, and they're sitting back thinking, I've got the world by the tail. And they're looking back on everything they've done. That's a proud fool. And if they're not saved, they're going to die and bust hell wide open. What did they live their whole life for? To pass on what they had, earthly. And what is it? It's just junk. Outside of maybe a Bible that somebody used to read. You know, you got great, 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 great grandmama's house and you're going through it and you're picking through all the stuff and maybe you find something you can put on eBay, but then you find a Bible. That'd be pretty cool to neat, but all the other stuff is just junk. Oh, preacher, there's a quilt that was quilted back in the 1830s. I understand all the sentimental stuff, but you know what's going to happen? I'm not trying to be mean. Here I go again. I'm old Solomon, you know. I'm just telling you, either you're going to have to pack it up and sell it or somebody's going to trifle through it after you're gone. It's just junk. It's just stuff. This is the hoarder's lesson for the night. <laughs> All right, we're in Proverbs. Let's look at a couple more here. Uh, 28, Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, look down, if you will, in verse number 25. This goes along with the other verse about contention. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. So how do you stir up strife? You open your mouth. And somebody could have something buried. Somebody could have said something about somebody. And, you know, maybe it was off the cuff. Maybe they were having a bad day. You know, whatever it was, they rubbed them on. They made a little smart out of the comment. And then the other person just, oh, uh, well, whatever. You know, they, didn't, they got over. Then here comes the co-worker. And they're like, yeah, you going to let them get away with that? Hey, he didn't just say that. When he went back in the break room, he said blankety blank blank and all this other stuff. He did. Yeah, and, you know, last week when you were in, gone for a long lunch, he said such and such. Stirs it up. All right, one more. 29. 29. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor will uphold the humble in spirit. Better be humble or you will stumble. And so disdainful look, a proud look. Let's come back and look at our, our list here. We'll work through the rest of these. Here's a good hymn that we have. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. When you come to Christ, you've got to come with that pride and just lay it down and say, I cannot save myself. You did that when you got saved. But how is it as believers we often pick that thing up and we think that we are doing this and we think that we're self-sufficient? That pride comes in. That self gets in. Proverbs 6. These things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look. So we have a disdainful look. Notice the second one, a deceitful tongue. A lying tongue. Psalm 52, 2. The, Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Deceitful tongue. Um, a lying tongue. Uh, making an excuse, you know, back when people had phones at home and they would ring. I've still got one. I don't have it hooked up, but I've got a kind of an antique phone there that's just got the little, you know. And if I hook that thing up, it doesn't work because it's something to do with the phone company. They won't even let you have that no more. But anyway, that thing would ring and you didn't know who it was. So you would answer it or you would get your kids to answer it. <laughs> But if it's Aunt Martha or whoever that you know you really don't want to talk to, you know what you would say? I'm not here. I'm in the shower. I'm in the shower. <laughs> so what is that? That is a lie. 
Kind of like somebody calls now, you just hit a little thing on your phone and it says, I can't talk now, I'll call you later. <laughs> Making an excuse when you, don't have, when you don't have to do anything. Calling in sick to work when you're not sick. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. Saying you couldn't come because you had to go somewhere. Those kind of things. We don't think about lies like that, but a lot of times it is a lying tongue. Now, Proverbs is going to deal with the tongue a lot. That little thing right there gets us into trouble. Now it's not just the tongue, it's the thumbs. You know, blah, 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 you just say it, you blurt it out. You And some people, they with this texting thing and with email stuff, they become more bold. They'll say things behind a computer or behind a phone they would never say to your face. Like, if you're going to talk that way, if we got this much to talk about, you need to come talk to me. But that's still a lying tongue. That's, that's deceit. It's a razor. Man, a sharp razor. You ever been, that's one thing to get cut by a knife. You ever get cut by a razor? Man, that thing will get you. It'll split you open. Say, so words won't hurt me. Yeah, they do. Words destroy people. Hitler never sh fired a shot. 56 million people died. He used his tongue. He won by one vote. That's how he got elected. So, so they say. Disdainful look, deceitful tongue. We'll say more about the tongue as we work through Proverbs, I'm sure. Then notice a deadly hand. Uh, notice he says a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. Exodus 21, 12, still in the Bible. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely, be surely put to death. I heard some good news today. They, uh, or yesterday, they got the uh, executions going again after 20 years. They finally got some old Supreme Court thing overturned. Numbers chapter 35, Moreover, you shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. And ye shall take no satisfaction for him that is fled to the city of his refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. 33, So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. Listen to this. For blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. This is a bloody land. 35,000, whatever it takes in Florida to feed an inmate every year. We're giving $35,000 to feed them. And some of them, according to the Bible, they've already forfeited their life. Here's what happens. Somebody takes an innocent person's life. Innocent people. Good people. And everybody feels bad for that at first. But then when 45 years come around and they finally get up where it's time to put them in old Sparky or put the injection or whatever... Everybody, all of a sudden, the murderer's life is so precious. How can we dare do anything to this poor, precious man? So I just don't think that way. Well, you don't think like God. God said he hates it. Let's move through these. We'll be done. Notice next, we have not just a deadly hand, but a depraved heart. See, he really digs in this thing. He gets deeper. Somebody's a murderer not because they killed somebody. They killed somebody because they already were a murderer. You don't, you're not a sinner because you've sinned. You commit sins because you are a sinner. The problem is the heart. And so he gets into this. He says, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Genesis chapter 6, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and the every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now think about this. I don't have it marked, so don't, I'm, I'm kind of loose with this. Adam lived to be 930 years old. The flood happens at like uh, 1570, 1580. So Adam hadn't been dead too much longer for when you have Noah and the people that are there, you know, for the flood. So you have just a few generations, really, from Adam. And Noah's said to be the seventh generation, right? Or the eighth. He's the eighth from Adam. Think about Adam, 930 years old. He's sitting there watching around and seeing how deep-rooted sin is and the results of what he did. And he's watching it play out. And it gets worse and worse, and worse, and worse. All we're watching is the results since after the flood for about 4,000 years. After God, you know, he busted them up one time at the Tower of Babel because they all got together. And he says, man, if I let them get together, they're going to imagine all kind of stuff. They're going to have all kind of images. They'll come up with all kind of devices. 
And so now they've got all back together and they've come up with all kind of images. They've come up with all kind of devices and they've booted God out again. So what's he about to do? He's about to step back down again and say, let me go to and go to. Let me see what, did, what tower the children of men build. He's going to come and check it out. A depraved heart. Fifteen prominent college professors took this challenge. They said, if all the books on the art of moving human beings into action were condensed into one brief statement, what would that statement be? The result, this is what they came up with. In other words, how can you move people to do things? They said this, what the mind attends to, it considers. What the mind does not attend to, it dismisses. What the mind attends to continually, it believes. What the mind believes... It eventually does. And man's heart is wicked. He's constantly, continually bombarded with wickedness. If you as a Christian do not separate yourself from the influence of wickedness in this society, it will corrupt you. You're already corrupt. It'll just build and feed the corruption that's inside of you. All right, let's move through and be done. Notice not just the depraved heart, but a delinquent foot. Notice he says, feet that be swift and run into mischief. Your feet take you where your heart wants to go. Proverbs 1.16, he says, their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. That thing about running, being swift to move and swift to go, that's, that's, that's the age. There's a, there's a heartbeat. Now, our heart beats faster and faster, and everybody's on the move, everybody's on the go, and the Bible talks about the devil going to and fro, and everybody's running. And you say, what are they running? They're running to get into trouble. And then notice a dishonest witness, a false witness that speaketh lies. That lies is repeated twice in this passage. Exodus 20, 16 is still in the Bible. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It's one of the Ten Commandments. In Proverbs chapter 12, he says, He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Somebody that would stand up there and lie and say something that's not so to try to put evidence on somebody. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Proverbs 14 verse 5, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Two examples. Number one, with Stephen, you remember the case? The Bible says they had these false witnesses and they bore false witness against Stephen to have him killed. And the greatest example is Jesus Christ. They had brought the false witnesses in front of him and began to say all these things, all these accusations against Christ. And finally, let's look at the last abomination that's listed here. God hates this stuff. Verse 19, he that soweth discord among brethren. Proverbs 16, a froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Proverbs 22:10, cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out, yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Proverbs 26, 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Man, that's a profound statement. <laughs> and I know another profound statement. That's not in the Bible, but it's true. You can't burn wet wood. Wet wood won't burn. But he says, where the wood is, where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. If you would keep your mouth shut and you wouldn't say things, even, well, I don't repeat gossip. So listen carefully the first time. You know, that's a common thing. Um, I'm not gossiping. I'm just telling you the truth. Probably three quarters of gossip is truth. But you don't need to know it. Think the best about everybody. Or forget about what you've already heard, if it is true. I'm glad, and I know some of you are more spiritual than I am, but I, can't, I couldn't handle social media, knowing everybody's business. I don't want to know all your business. Now, if you have a problem and you want to counsel and you want to talk, I have no problem sitting down, giving you some scriptural stuff from the Bible. I'm not saying that. But everybody knowing everybody's business, that, that's not healthy. And I'm not saying, you know, good neighbors and neighbors know, hey, I didn't saw your truck was broke down, so I was figuring, you know, if you want to borrow my truck, you know. I'm not saying that, but I, this, this very invasive, or not really invasive, it's basically I'm just opening my door. I'm going to take a picture of everything I do all day long, and everybody's going to see it, and everybody's going to know everything I'm doing. Not me. Meddlers. 
a deliberate meddler. That's the last one. So in discord. A brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city, the Bible says, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Here's a scenario, and I'll be done. Here's a man, and let's just say it's a larger church, and, and uh, he's been teaching Sunday school, but he's really wanting to kind of move up and take a different class and been praying about it and really excited about it. And the positions come open and the church is growing. There's good stuff happening in the church. And so uh, there's an opportunity for this man to maybe take this Sunday school class. But the pastor asks someone else to take it. Well, this guy doesn't sit too well with him. So he's a little bit upset. He didn't say anything right away, but after church one day, him and another buddy go out and he just kind of starts grumbling a little bit. He gets to where since now he doesn't have his class because he had given his class up. He gets to where he starts missing church a little bit more. And next thing you know, the guy he had been grumbling with, he started grumbling a little bit more with this guy, and he began to really down the church. And the guy that he grumbled with, he got on the bandwagon. At first, he's like, hey, man, you were just saying two weeks ago how great of a church this is. We're seeing people saved. Things are going good. And what are you doing now? What do you say all this for? He says, well, I just don't think that, you know, the pastor's making some right decisions and these other people that are teaching these classes, they're not really all that qualified. And I'm just not sure. And he just goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, just run the scenario in your head. And it goes to just more than one person because now the second guy, he's done got a beef because, you know, five years ago, somebody said something to his wife when she was bringing tater salad and it wasn't supposed to be her time to bring tater salad and it kind of got backwards. And he's really upset that they didn't ask her to help out at the funeral. And boy, he's really in a fury now. I'm telling you, this kind of stuff happens. People normally don't quit the church because they're upset that you're teaching you know, the, the three and a half years of the tribulations, the great tribulation and the seal, and you have the difference in the seal, difference in the trumpet. No, no, it's not about that kind of stuff. It's about you didn't eat my potato salad or you didn't invite me to do such and such or how come I didn't get to sing or how come you didn't recognize me or how come I didn't get a plaque on the wall because I donated some money or whatever it is. Amen. But that... Here's the problem. If you go to a church, you're going to be in a church with imperfect people, and somebody is going to hurt your feelings. I'm sure I will hurt your feelings. You have definitely hurt my feelings. I ain't going to lie about it. What are you going to do? I'm going to choose to love each and every one of you because you're my church family. It's amazing how people will love their flesh and blood family when sometimes they do stuff that you ought to be like I ain't even going to talk to you for five years until you get right with God but yet you still let them come over to your house but then somebody in the church don't shake your hand and you want to announce World War III why don't you choose to love instead of and here's the problem it's okay to get hurt and say I'm going to go home and stew about this and I'm mad and I'm going to pray God gets a hold of that person and I'm going to pray the wrath of God on them till they get right because they know I'm right because I know I'm right that's okay. Keep it to yourself. But the problem is when you run your mouth. That's right. Even if it's about something that's true. Because what you do is you sow discord and then you get this one against that one and that group against that group and then you get this thing that's supposed to be unified begins to break down. Now here in the context, I believe he's talking about family, brethren. He's talking about brothers. That's why he talks in that passage about a brother is born, as I think Ecclesiastes, a brother is born for adversity. Better is a neighbor, a neighbor that is near than a brother born afar off, you know. Because that, that contention can come down, like Cain and Abel, like Jacob and Esau. Boy, when that stuff gets stirred up, he that soweth discord among brethren, and people are good at that stuff, sowing discord. Now, in conclusion, Jezebel fits all of these sins. I was reading a commentary, and it brought this out, and I thought that was pretty remarkable. Think about it, a proud look. Jezebel paints her face all up. She gets all out. She's got to be Mrs. Queen. A lying tongue. She forges letters in Ahab's name. She's nothing but a liar. Uh, shed innocent blood. She killed the prophets of the Lord. She would have killed Elijah. She had Naboth killed. Um... Devise wicked imagination. She was uh, all into idolatry. She was the daughter of the, uh, the, the Zidonian god, uh, uh, king, and uh, she worshipped the Phoenician goddesses and so forth. Uh, she devised wicked imagination. She planned that whole scenario out, how to kill Naboth so Ahab could get the vineyard. Uh, 
And then her feet was swift and running to mischief. She wrote letters real quickly. She did it really fast to get all the stuff passed through. Here's this bill, and we're going to tack this on the bottom of it. So what's the solution for all our politicians? Vote every single one of them out. That's the solution. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Feet swift and running to mischief. False witnesses. What does she do? She got the people together to accuse Naboth of blasphemy. And she got false witnesses to say, you know, you, you know what could happen in our news media controlled society? You could have five or six news people, people come to your house with four or five strangers that don't even know you. They could accuse you of something, put it on the news. You would lose your job and you'd lose your house within 24 hours. You could be completely innocent. You'd be exonerated maybe a month later, but nobody would know about it. <laughs> That's where we are. You say, what is it? Right here in the passage. So in discord among the brethren. And she definitely did that. Whenever she finally got what was coming to her and Joram saw Jehu, he said, uh, is it peace, Jehu? And Jehu answered, what peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. She had multiplied that stuff. All the daughters of the land wanted to be like Jezebel. And she sowed discord throughout that whole land. So what does God say about it? He says he hates it. He hates all of those things, and we need to hate those things as well. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. Lord, help us to have a healthy love or a healthy hate and a lousy love. Lord, help us to love the right things and hate the wrong things. God, I pray that you might uh, quicken our minds and our hearts. Lord, point out these areas, especially the areas of pride. We all struggle with it. And God, I pray that uh, we would realize that uh, we deal with these issues and help us to face it head on and to be brave enough to take some reproof and rebuke. And I pray that you might work on us. Help us, Lord. We want to be better Christians. I pray for these that were mentioned tonight. And I know there's probably some unspoken requests here tonight that you might answer those needs. Be with our church family. We pray, God, that you might bless us and help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.